Well, hi and welcome to this uh, Expo North session on uh, business planning for authors. My name is Peter Erpeth and I am Expo North Specialist Advisor in the writing and publishing sector. And it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome back to Expo North uh, international best-selling author and award-nominated author Joanna Penn, um, who many in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland will know. Joanna's done a lot of work over the years for us in uh, promoting professional skills and business skills within uh, independent authorship. And Joanna is indeed a pioneer of much of that, um, uh, of, of those skills, a creative entrepreneur and um, an internationally renowned uh, professional speaker in this area. Um, this uh, session uh, focuses on uh, Joanna's new uh, book, Your Author Business Plan, uh, which um, I've got uh, paper copies here. Um, the book comes also with a, a second volume, which is a, a companion workbook, which has lots of useful prompts. And you can, um, at the end of this interview, uh, there's um, links as to how you can obtain copies of these books available in in print and uh, as digital copies and indeed how to connect with Joanna. So without uh, any further delay, here is your author business plan. So just to start, can I ask you, what was your own personal journey to this? I mean, obviously you've made business plans and now you've written a book about business plans for authors. So what was your personal journey to that actual approach? Mm. Well, thanks for having me, Pete. And um, yeah, in terms of business, I should say that I spent 13 years uh, as a business consultant um, implementing IT systems. I used to implement accounts payable into large corporates and also small and medium sized companies. So I worked in business in the corporate world for 13 years. And I, I've always liked having money to spend. You know, I like travel when we can travel. And so when I started to get into the writing space when I looked at, you know, I really want to write a book. I, I want to change my career. Didn't want to uh, do accounts payable anymore. Uh, I was never going to be the poor author in the garret. So from day one, when I first thought about writing a book, it was always, okay, how do I actually leave my job and do this full time? And if I do it full time, then it needs to be a good living. And so even back then, this was for 2006, I started writing my first nonfiction book. And I was actually at the time looking at things like the Forbes richest author list and uh, looking at the authors. I was also in the National Speakers Association. So I was surrounded by nonfiction and I could see fiction authors who were making loads of money. And it was like, okay, well, what do they do? So from the beginning, I always intended to make it a business. And then what happened amazingly, so 2006, I started um, writing and then 2007, 2008, of course, the ebook started to be a thing. And suddenly this penny dropped. There's still a video on my YouTube channel from 2009, I think it is, when I got the first international Kindle. I was living in Australia. And I'm, I say, this is the way we can sell books to everyone in the world. For, for, first of all, the American market, which is huge. So once that happened, once that tipping point happened with eBooks, so 2008, 2009, of course, we, we started getting the iPhone. Uh, iPhone. Um, I started a podcast. Podcasting started to take off. So what happened was the whole internet business model shifted in favor of the creator. And that's what I embraced over a decade ago. And here we are, 2021, as we record this, and the opportunities just increase more and more over time. So I've gone from sort of that first $2 that I made online to making multi six figures now through multiple streams of income. And we can come back to that if you like, but that's really important to me. It's about so much more than just, oh, I'm going to write one book and get a traditional publishing deal and I'm set for life. I mean, that's just not true anymore. Uh, even if you get if you have one book and an amazing publishing deal, that probably won't set you up for life. So my kind of mission now is to empower authors with the knowledge they need to make a living with their writing. But you're right, you do have to have that business mindset, but you can learn that. You can develop these skills in order to get deeper into this area. I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because in a way you uh, uh, are part of a kind of a first wave in a way that there's elements of pioneering going on here and of, of sort of like prototyping what works and doesn't doesn't work and then you know these years later that gets distilled into a a plan but what was the kind of interaction between the the business side and the creative side if they can be you know distinguished did you 
write start writing your business plan because the creative was so successful and then you had to react to the situation you find yourself in or did you business plan and that opened up the the progression on and opened up the creative hmm. opportunities and so on which which way round was it well it was i mean still it's i separate the two so i have two very different time blocks in my day now and i always have done since i had a day job the morning, so the mornings, when that used to be five till 6 a.m. Now it's most of the morning uh, till lunchtime-ish is my creative time. And most of the time, I don't think about business or money or anything. I just create stuff. <laughs> so usually books, maybe podcasts, sometimes uh, other things. But, you know, that's my creative time. And then the afternoon, we're recording this in the afternoon. I do my podcast. I do my business. I talk to my accountant. I do marketing. So I have always separated the creative time and the business time. But then in terms of what came first in the creative pen, which is my business, it was uh, the the idea of leaving my job. And this is the thing, if people listening, if you love your work, then awesome, keep your job and just, you can write for the love of it. It doesn't matter. You know, I know you do a lot of music as well. Like you don't need to make a living with what you love as your art. And it does put pressure on your art in order to try and make a living. But what I, I had got to the point in my job where I was just crying at work. I was so miserable and I just hated it. I could not stand it any longer. And I had to get out. I was sick. Uh, and I was like, okay, well then how do I combine my art with the internet in order to make a living. And I did actually, my first business plan, I mentioned this in the book, is a was a big A2, P, one piece of paper. And this is what I would say to people, you don't need to write, write a book <laughs> in order to do a business plan. I had one piece of paper with the creative pen in the middle and some arrows out to things. And it had eBooks, it had teaching, it had courses, you know, it had merchandise, which is hilarious because I've never really done that. But it had all these ideas. And then from there, what I did was investigate how to do each of these things. So I had, you know, get my book on the iPhone, which now of course is much easier than it was over a decade ago. But that's how I started. It was, I want to write, I want to write, I'm a writer, but how do I actually also leave my job? And then I should say, so that was 2006, I first started writing. 2008, I started my website and my podcast. And then 2011 was when I left my job, but it wasn't until 2015 when I made the same amount of money as what I had left behind. And now I make much more money than I ever did in a day job. But it, just to give people this kind of time frame, it's not like, oh, I'm going to leave my job and next week I'll be making tons of money. It's it, that is not the reality. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that in the in the book it comes through very strongly that about how much um, of your approach to business planning is actually born out of really hard experience and out of hard uh, sort of hard experience with the view that other people don't necessarily have to follow that hopefully not aspect of the journey <laughs> it's a fantastic shortcut and i think that's one of the whole beauties of the business plan is it's dynamic and we can learn from each other as well um i um just to, just to start with at the beginning of this um of your approach which in many ways does look and feel like um very standard business planning it's not actually that different from any kind of manufacturing mm. business plan might be i mean obviously the content is uh, and the processes are different but the sorts of things that need to be thought about and i think that's really interesting in a project like this is that there is no separate magic for a business plan for a creative individual or creative business it does look and feel by necessity i think the same as for any business plan i mean did, did, did you sort of borrow that from your previous experience you know you've been in a corporate world Yes, absolutely. Um, and I do have a much bigger book called Business for Authors, which, uh, you know, goes into things like taxation and all that kind of thing. But this this book was really trying to take it to a high level. But you're absolutely right. There's, we might like to think we're special snowflakes or that we're artists, so we must do things differently. But the reality is, 
we create a product. I mean, if you do it for the love, that's fine. But if you're going to run a business, you know, a business plan is for a business which aims to make money. That is the point of a business. Yes, we want to put great art into the world, but um, we also want to make a uh, bank, basically. So when I thought about the business plan, you're right. I mean, I even put the words production plan in the in the business plan, which I know, like, oh my goodness, you mean like like robots in a factory? And I talk about the factory I used to work in, and you need you know, we need time and we need inspiration and we need research. And then we need to sit down and do the work, which is the production. And then we need the publishing if we're independent and the marketing and all this. So there's, you do have to think about your process because at the end of the day, like as an author, I have to produce books. That is my number one thing, my number one product. And then I also have to think about my customers. So the same as any business, I have a product, I have customers, I have vendors, people that I have to pay to help me. So a cover designer, editor, for example, my accountant that I mentioned. And then you have to think about marketing. You have to think about your financial management. And so all of those things are absolutely no different. So I'm a sole employee in my company it's exactly the same for, I used to work for one of the biggest mining companies in the world. And my account, you know, my chart of accounts doesn't look that different to a mining company. It's just the things in the buckets are different and the numbers, obviously. So yes. And I don't want people to be put off by the idea that we're just like any other business. In fact, it makes it easier because if you can separate that art from that business person, you can be like, okay, well, how do I slot that in to that area? How do I think about it differently? And some of this language also makes it less emotional because we can get pretty emotional about our art, yeah. but it's better to not be so emotional about our business and to really think, okay, well, so how do I serve my customer in the best way? How does my business serve my customer rather than how do I write my book over here? So it's quite a different mindset. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think emotion is a good uh, a good segue as a as a as a concept into some of the opening parts of this book, in which you uh, introduce by absolute necessity. I totally get that the the difficult concept of the author brand. Now, oh. <laughs> difficult from the outside to see an author brand, but from the inside, I think this is an area of this approach that many writers mm. really struggle with. Do they need to do it? How do they do it? Um, and and you know why what what's the benefit um but in you know all business plans these days have sections like this you know have have a uh, um a kind of a a mission and values type statement or a purpose or whatever whatever language people like to put on it what what would be your recommendations around this why do we need to do this and how do we get into that how do people actually determine what are their core values? What are the values of the brand they are, you know, mm. to, 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 to establish do, work with? It is really hard. So that's the first thing to say up front. And what I would also say is one of the things we talk about amongst authors, you know, is finding your author voice. And when you're a new author, this is complete mysticism. You literally don't understand what people are talking about. I still remember this going, what are they talking about? you know, what does author voice even mean? And then by about book five, you figure out your author voice. And this is mainly with fiction, but in some ways, nonfiction. But with fiction, I remember it, my book Desecration, I was like, oh, I've just found my voice. This is awesome. And I think it's the same with brand. So I, uh, the brand is your promise to the reader. Yeah. And what what do they expect from a brand? And do, do you deliver to that promise? So for example, Stephen King, although perhaps he has not done this deliberately, most people are gonna expect something dark, you know, whether it's horror or sci-fi or whatever, it's going to have some darkness. It probably has a high body count. You know, he is his name is synonymous with horror. So you pretty much know what you're going to get. Um, I loved J.K. Rowling writing under Robert Galbraith. I actually love her books as Robert Galbraith. I much prefer them. And that shift of brand was genius because the expectation of a J.K. Rowling book fell short when she did The Casual Vacancy. People were like, this isn't what I expected from Rowling. This is horrible. Whereas actually that book's awesome. But do, do you see? So the expectations of a brand are hugely important. And what you want as a reader 
Uh, I mean, James Patterson, one of the top selling authors in the world, you know, it's it's a page turner. It's like somebody turns a page on a Patterson book every 10 every second or something ridiculous. Um, so you have to think about, right, so what is my promise to the reader? And it won't, it's unlikely to be obvious from day one. So that would be my tip is, look, you can feel your way into an author brand. So where I am now, so again, I started writing in 2006. In 2012, I split my brand into two. So I used to write my fiction under Joanna Penn. And then in 2012, I discovered that I was really mixing up my brand. So Joanna Penn now writes nonfiction books to empower authors and JF Penn, which is my thriller and dark fantasy brand, writes thrillers, dark fantasy adventure with a strong sense of place. So travel and I have books and travel podcast. And so I've slowly over the years built up JF Penn as a separate brand to Joanna Penn. And it has helped me so much because I know my Joanna Penn reader is this person and my JF Penn reader is this person. How do I satisfy that promise? So it can be very hard for people if you're trying to do everything under one brand. Um, and of course, it's much easier, I guess, as a business, you know, um, Expo North, you know, you know what you do is that, um, you know, whereas Pete Erpeth does a lot of different things yeah. to that brand. So I would say that those are some of the main things. Uh, also, just to say a brand is not a logo. <laughs> I feel like everyone goes, oh, it's just a logo. No, it's not a logo. It really is that promise to the reader and the expectations uh, over time. Does it, does that make sense? It, indeed it does. And I think there's one thing here, though, where you, you I asked that question, you talk a lot about the reader. Are reader requirements the driver of the brand? Are the issues around who I am or what I want to be or what I want to do, are they the driver of the brand? Or are, is that a false distinction? I think it's probably a false distinction in that I, for Joanna Penn, I started sharing my journey on a blog and a podcast back before people, well, back when self-publishing was dirty a dirty word, basically. And so over the years, as I shared more and more, people turned up and started listening and started reading and started buying my books. And I didn't, I have changed, obviously, but I didn't change. I've always been you know, pro-independent, you know, pro-author, all of those things. And so that was my core value as such. And over time, you attract people who resonate with your value. I mean, the fact is there are so many voices out there in the world. You have to choose who you listen to. So you are attracted to people you resonate with. So I have just tried to I am consistent because that's the way I am artistically, but people have arrived because they resonate with that. And with my fiction, I have always written my novels based on my travels. And, you know, I'm definitely a bit darker as JF Penn. I, you know, uh, have a few, have a shadow side as we all do. And but the, pe the people who are attracted to my JF Penn books resonate with sense of place. Um, you know, maybe they like graveyards like I do. Maybe they enjoy reading some Stephen King. So that's, and again, I haven't changed myself. I have just attracted a readership. So then that becomes the thing. I think the biggest problem, if you try and write to, write to market, which is a thing, and many people do it successfully, is can you sustain that over time? Does it make you happy over time? And at the end of the day, this is about meaning, not just about money. And although I really like making money, I'm not going to change my artistic sense to fit, to try and attract a readership that won't resonate with me. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, is it? Because uh, when you look at it in that way, a mission, uh, a brand with a mission that is to fulfil the needs of uh, people who read the most popular fiction at any one time, or who mm. to, to always be on trend with the with the global chart. That's a that's a nearly impossible job. I mean, no yeah. one can do that. I mean, big publishing houses who publish hundreds of different authors might be able to make such an aspiration, but mm. individual writer, this is born out of who you are, isn't it? I think, you know, and, and that is also what is doable in the end, you know? Yeah. And more important than that, like we're recording this during lockdown again, during the pandemic and it, it, the pandemic is, you know, one of, I guess the silver linings is time to really think about what's important in your life because time is really short. We all have face to face with mortality in a much more immediate way. And so 
if it takes X amount of time to write a book, do you want to spend that time writing something that you're not proud of or that you can't say, this is my book. It's brilliant. I really love it. Uh, or that, you know, it just is too short. You know, I've got on my wall here, create a body of work I'm proud of. And that I think as artists should be the underlying thing. And then, yes, there's lots of things you can do to make a living. So for example, you know, different formats um, or even, you know, other things like teaching, speaking, uh, you know, we both have sponsorship or, you know, I have a Patreon and there's lots of ways you can make other streams of income that can supplement the money from just your book sales. Yeah. I mean, I, I, just just one final sort of question around that thing. How much time do you think in terms of the overall amount of time that people might want to spend on putting a business plan together, which I think is quite, should be quite a time consuming business and shouldn't be rushed. It, this is a difficult section to complete, isn't it? And it's dynamic. I mean, it, did, did yours still change? Do you find, I mean, if you, did you settle your, you know, these sort of brand statements and they've been like that now for five years or uh, oh if you mean if you mean the brand statements that I wrote in the book which yeah. um they were written when I wrote the book <laughs> So what was what I do with nonfiction, I think many nonfiction people do this, is we write the book to articulate what we really think. Yeah. And what I found in writing the, the, the business plan book was, oh, I really have to articulate this in a better way. And so I came up again with it. I've, I've had various iterations of things over the years, as you do. But this is probably the, the, the thing with a business plan. It's not static. You're going to change things all the time. And it's, you know, either you've, for example, I used to do a lot of webinars where I do joint venture activities with people, um, you know, promoting various things that were, I used and were good for my audience. It was always ethical affiliate marketing, but um, I, it was always in the evening because of America. It had to be in the evening. And I just decided I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. So on my previous business plan of like a couple of years ago, that was quite a large chunk, you know, do what one webinar a month was thing and it would add this much to my business. And I just took that all out. It was like, nope, that's going. And so what can I do instead to bring other things into the void that that has, has created? So for example, I'm getting into a lot of the artificial intelligence and blockchain and new economy of the next decade. Um, that has enabled me time to do it. So my business plan for this year is actually quite different to how it's been over the last few years. Although my underlying brand and mission statement stays the same for Joanna Penn and JF Penn, I'm giving myself space and time to look in, into these new things. So what I would say to people is, um, in, you asked about the amount of time you should spend. I would say whatever amount of time that you have that's not scary. <laughs> so as I said, if you are literally going, I'm not doing that, then sit down with a one A4 piece of paper, oh, I threw my pen on the ground there, um, and a pen and just draw something circle in the middle, arrows, that's your plan. And if you have a bit more time, then yeah, sure, go through these different sections, maybe create a document. We are writers after all. Um, and then, but I would challenge people to really only make it one or two pages, um, A4 pages of normal sized text, none of this size eight font, because the biggest problem I think with business plans is people try and do too much too fast and then go oh well that all just failed whereas you know for example if you're listening and you haven't finished your first book yet then that's your business plan it's finish the book like literally that's all it needs to be so you're done <laughs> and if you've been going a while um then you can start thinking about the other different things that would come into it yeah i mean i think it sort of cuts to a, to a part of the book right at the other end of it to, the, to that of branding is the way that you organize this there's a, a chapter here that actually divides this journey into stages um which um i think uh well, well probably the ones that you experience which i think are all mm. pretty much universal as well i mean i do a lot of talking to writers in terms of sort of like one-to-one -one support and consultation and it's amazing how often these stages actually do kind of a, arise and how People feel that they're either stuck in one or they they can't move to another. And what's the solution and so on? And um, mm -hmm. uh, I think I think there's something really, really realistic and tangible tangible about the levels of these. Um, uh, and that's um, you know kind of stage three out of four is the one where you say 
you have a stable income as an author. This isn't stage one. I mean, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. So just just briefly for people, um, you know, stage one is that startup mode, and generally the money is flowing out because yeah. you're, for example, writing a novel. You re- you don't know how to write a novel until you do some training, you do some courses, you hire some editors, you do some writing, and you know that my first novel, I ended up doing like a course at a local library and all these things, and you you know you buy a lot of books on writing. I mean, and there are so many things in a startup mode that you. Need to think. So for me, I guess that would have been uh, between 2006 and 2011 um, was really learning, developing my craft, um, all these different things. And then stage two is that just scraping by, which is, oh, look, I'm making a little bit of profit and okay, I need to spend that on some advertising. (laughs) So uh, I probably can't necessarily leave my job or for example, we downsized. So my wonderful supportive husband agreed because I was the main uh, wage earner at the time we sold our house we sold the car you know we we pretty much downsized got rid of our debt so that we could scrape by and i know that's not possible for a lot of people but that phase of going back to basics like a lot of authors will move somewhere cheaper i mean we're now in the pandemic living in a world of working from home so that might actually be more possible for a lot of people but um as i said i took a, a pay cut um so between 2011 and 2015 it was kind of yeah just scraping by and and then uh you know if you have a partner who has a job maybe that can help but i don't ever want that's never my answer it's not you can't depend on someone else you can't depend on the government because you know th- things change and then as you say stage 3 is that stable income with a steady profit and this is uh, i've got a book called how to make a living with your writing and again it is not seven figure book deal you know crash it, making a living is a long term thing uh, i'm 45 i want to be making a living with my writing and until i die and then also leave an estate um but a stable income with a steady profit is like a salary so i pretty much know how much is coming into my bank account every month from all the vendors my patrons my sponsors all of that so and actually um i remember it was at edinburgh book fair years ago china mieville gave a talk on writers not making any money And I was sitting there, I wasn't sitting in Edinburgh, but I read about this later and he said, writers need a salary. And I was, I read this and went, yes. And it's called independent publishing (laughs) because you actually, instead of these spike levels of money that arrive, you don't know when, like all the authors whose books got moved because of the pandemic, they didn't get their payment on publication. Maybe they didn't get it yet. Whereas with Indie, I know if I sell, and in fact, selling direct, the money's in my bank account within minutes. Um, and this is incredibly exciting or with Amazon, Kobo, Apple, uh, Ingram, all these different vendors, it might be 60 days, but it's still, I know exactly how much money is coming. So that's stable income with steady profit is a living and it, it can be long-term. And then of course the final stage four, the wealthy author. Um, and I've, uh, the, I'm not, kind of putting myself in that bracket because to me that's like a seven figure uh you know thing but I do know authors who make that and you know I I feel it is uh attainable if you want to go that far but for many people a stable income with steady profit for the rest of your life is quite good (laughs) I mean it's interesting as well because I think uh, since um independent authors um you know when and all of that started. I remember listening as well at book fairs to some writers who would say, you know, that it isn't, of course, just a straight diagonal line from nothing to wealth. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's a series of plateaus. And mm. um, I, I think one of the interesting things about a business plan is that it's as much about consolidation as it is growth. It's about mm. how do you actually maintain this? You know, well, how, what's the element of sustainability? And, and if you're an author whose works are solely in the hands of publishers i think that element of sustainability is that much more difficult because you don't control the outcomes of those things you can't tweak you can't you know your your everything you do your marketing and all the rest of it is tied to somebody else's schedule and yeah uh, and they and their control so for example i can do a price promotion and some advertising and sell a ton of books 
and, and I know, again, I know pretty much how much money I'm going to make. And if I send out an email, I know how much money I'm going to make. And these are things that you can only do if you have control. Now, I'm not knocking traditional publishing as one of the options that authors have, but the, the best of all worlds is uh, having some books with traditional publishers for whatever reason you decide is important. For example, um, you know, awards uh, is a really good reason to want to be with a publisher or license specifically. So many of the wonderful Scottish uh, publishing houses, for example, you could license your physical books to a Scottish publisher for print only in the UK, and you could self-publish your ebook in the rest of the world. So or many authors might have signed a contract for UK Commonwealth. Well, why not self-publish in America and the rest of the world? You know, I've sold books in 158 countries or something ridiculous now. And that's because they are distributed in all of those countries. And most authors' books are not even there. Or, for example, other formats like audiobooks or, you know, print on demand or hardbacks or doing all these different kinds of things, turning it into an online course if it's uh, nonfiction. There are lots of ways to exploit your intellectual property assets for yourself. But, and I know you do a lot of education on this, but I feel like many authors forget that they've created an intellectual property asset and that publishers are not charities. The reason they will give you money is so that they own and control that intellectual property asset. So if we do that for ourselves, then we can be empowered and we can make these multiple streams of income. But of course, I do licensing deals. I just don't do them for world English and the formats that I like to do myself, like ebook, audiobook, print on demand. I mean, yeah, it's fascinating, really, that that sort of um, distinction. It's not, I mean, I think now, so many years after the power of the ebook for the independent author emerged, you know, we do, all writers, I think, look into the future, will very much work in a mixed economy. And they should know all sides of this, you know, and that the business plan should, should actually encompass that. Mm. That whole the the whole of the mainstream industry, which for me includes independent authors as professional um, writers, as career writers, as you know people people who who want to spend their their life doing that and find a way of of, of sustaining it. You know, um, I think that another thing about that as well is this about business planning is it enables you to understand why um, mm. so called traditional publishers may reject the work you know they've gone through this process themselves you know yeah it's so funny you say that because i appreciate more and more every year the difficult job that agents and publishers have and amusingly people pitch me all the time with their books and i'm like um no i'm an author i don't publish anyone you know i'm not don't pitch me that's pointless um but it's interesting or i do get pitched from my podcast for example or uh, interviews and the uh, i would say 90 Five percent of these pitches are appalling. They're absolutely terrible. And look, let's just put it out there. There's a lot of books that are published that are terrible and that is in the self-publishing space, but that's also in traditional publishing. I mean, let's face it, a lot of celebrity memoirs should just not be out there. Um, so let's not say it's about it's about quality, uh, you know, a lot of the time. But yeah, it's interesting how, but also remember that most successful publishers are niche publishers. They have specific taste. They have a specific audience. That's why we have imprints. They're sort of designed for specific groups of readers. And that's kind of the same thing that we've got to think, which is, you know, I know that some people, you know, if you like some of my JF Penn fiction, then awesome, you know, you're inside my brain. But I know that a lot of people listening might not be interested. It might not be their thing, whereas they might be interested in the nonfiction. So you have to think, okay, the same thing with publishers and agents, who is appropriate for um, for my kind of book, if you're looking to go that way. And what situation, what do I want to achieve? This is a really important thing is your definition of success. So from day one, when I wanted to leave my job, that was my definition of success. Leave my job. The next one was make six figures. And the next one was make multi six figures. And that's kind of where I am at the moment is, okay, uh, that's you know where I am. But you have to decide. Uh, and now I want to win a literary prize. So who knows what I might choose in order 
to achieve that goal, but it will be a different choice than I might have made towards some of the other goals. So that's really important for people to keep in mind. But as you say, with the business plan, you can write down the reasons behind your choices, which I feel like many authors don't think too hard about. They just follow the path they think is the path. Whereas there are so many choices now that we we can decide based on where we want to go. But do you know the overarching thing is this idea of empowerment. And I almost have I want to pat everyone on the back and say, look, you're an author, you're a creator, you're amazing. And your work is amazing, or it can be amazing if you go through the right process. Um, So please value your output, value your manuscript or your music or whatever you're creating, and then look for the best way to get that into the world and into the hands of people who are going to love it and hopefully make you some money as well. Yeah, I I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that indie authorship has done as well is close the gap between the writer and the reader. And I, and I think that that's a, a kind of a, a joyous phenomenon for those who have successfully done it. Because that was one of the things that traditional publishers used to own in this process was mm. actually the relationship between the book and the... And it's, the... it's funny, though. I disagree with that because actually most traditional publishers market directly to bookstores and distributors. And only in, in the last decade have they actually started adding sign up for our email list here. I don't actually think most publishers know who their readers are. They might have a nebulous idea, but most of them still don't have great email lists. You know, I know tradi- a lot of traditional publishers come to me, uh, authors uh, come to me and say, oh, you know, I had this really big success a decade ago and now I don't have an email list how do I market myself my publishers dump me what do I do and I'm like I'm sorry you kind of have to start from scratch you have to start building your relationship with your readers what's interesting now is I've as because I read um on the kindle I'm um, fiction on the kindle and now at the end of many of these books there's a publisher email list but most of the time they're ridiculously large like why would I sim- sign up for Simon and Schuster's email list yeah. That is pointless. Um, I don't want to hear about all of their books. Uh, whereas an author, you'll be like, yeah, I really like this author. I want to hear it from them specifically. And again, some of these imprints or niche publishers do a good job of this. But in general, I don't think publishers have had that relationship, although they are now really wanting that, especially post pandemic, during the pandemic, when a lot of sales are digital. Yeah. I mean, I think this. Um the things that you say here, although they are, I think, largely to some extent geared towards the indie author, you know, they also apply actually to somebody who that is not their path. There's so many questions, um, you know, the right questions asked in this book for anyone who wants to take any part in this. I think they need to know this and I think they need to do it. It's just the content of their their kind of product map and, and how they market it and so on is going to be different. But the, mm. the other elements of that are going to remain largely the same, whether you intend to be somebody who's agented and published solely in the traditional sense. Um, yeah, I actually think that the line is blurring successful traditionally published authors uh, are business savvy. They know about contracts. They know what the terms of the contract are. Even if they work with agents, they go through their contracts with a tooth comb. They negotiate on rates. They know what they've licensed. Um, I mean, I really know the difference uh, when I'm talking to traditionally published authors about who is business savvy, because the first thing I'll say is, so have you signed Worldwide English? And if they go, well, I don't know, I don't remember what was in my contract, that is very different to the author who understands what that terminology means, um, who understands the formats they might have signed. I mean, we've just seen a brilliant example um, on Kickstarter. I think I put this in the book. Uh, Brandon Sanderson, who is obviously multi-million bestseller, um, fantasy author with traditional publishing, you know, all the success a traditionally published author could want. Um, But he did a Kickstarter just in December 2020 and raised 6.7 million US dollars or something for the reprints 
of The Way of Kings, his first novel. This was a limited edition hardback reprint. Um, and what he did as a very savvy author was retain the rights to special editions of his books. And uh, 6.7 million, he obviously he's done, he's paid a lot of artists for great art. He's paid a, a specialist publisher to create these beautiful books. Plus at the same time, he's had incredible marketing and a really good payday. And he's an example of a traditionally published author who specifically excluded uh, special editions from his contract. Other people, for example, would make sure they sign UK Commonwealth instead of worldwide English or those who retain their audio rights. And so there are lots of ways that a traditionally published author can be business savvy and make sure um, they know what they're doing for their future. And then the beauty now is if you retain some of these rights, you can actually exploit them yourself yeah. uh, and can actually make an independent strategy of income at the same time. So I would encourage people, however you choose to publish, to think about these different things. Yeah, and I think that's such an important message that it's not a kind of a, a series of oppositional things where you have to be this or that. You know, mm -hmm. the mindset carries across. I think business planning will, will carry you across and find a way to actually make all of this work and be consistent and give you other tools, other assets that you own, such as your email list i mean in the book you you, you highlight this the the email list as like mm. one of your key assets it always sticks oh, out it takes, it's you know. so important do you know what we're not going to go into politics at all but what has happened with uh, donald trump in the us uh, arguably one of the most powerful people in the world up until very soon, as we record this, um, was removed from Twitter, from Facebook. Amazon have, you know, removed another social network. Uh, basically, his mouthpiece was removed. Now, whether or not you agree with that, it doesn't matter. What matters is he relied on these companies to reach people and then they changed the rules on him. And we've had this as authors with um, basically Amazon and changing the rules so we have to pay for advertising and tr traditional publishing and discovering this. Facebook used to be organic reach and now it's pretty much pay for advertising. The best asset after your book is going to be your email list because you can reach readers. And again, as I said, I can send out an email and know I'm going to sell books, make money, and I am independent of these platforms. Now, this is another reason I don't rely on Amazon for, for all my income at all. They're about 10% of my income. Um, so, you know, I'm very diverse with my income streams because I've been doing this long enough now that I've seen these things come and go. I mean, when I started, MySpace was the thing. And who knows what it's going to what it's going to be in a decade or even post big tech breakups which might well happen. Um it, who knows what will happen. So this is you're exactly right the email list and yeah as I said with what's happening with Trump has made me even more appreciative of a way to communicate with my fans because you never know when the rules are going to change basically. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting with the Trump thing because they, they did actually have a, a suddenly a plan B, which was an old website that yeah. had a, 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 a sort of a news, a, sort of like a free WordPress site, but it had a, a news column that hadn't been updated from about 2009. And, oh, there you go. <laughs> right, which was just called donaldjohn.com or something like that. And the drop in a reach, I mean, it's probably the most precipitous Mm. Uh, you know, kind of, um, and that well, that's the other thing with if you are a traditionally published author relying on your publisher to communicate. Many, you know, this how many authors stay with the same publisher, or how many publishers retain authors? A lot of them are let go or they part ways. So, don't rely on any of these um, places really to uh, to manage your email. It's really something that you want to manage yourself. I think one of the really interesting things in this uh, book is that you often use the phrase reader and listener interchangeably when it comes to things like uh, products uh, uh, and IP. How is audio going for you? And how do you think the coming year is going to be uh, in terms of the importance of audio for writers? 
Well, audio, uh, as we record this in the beginning of 2021, this year, I think, will be another huge year for audio. We're just going to have more and more options. There are rumors of Spotify coming in to the market, which is going to be really interesting. But the other thing, so we have the established players, you know, obviously uh, here in the UK, Audible is one of the big ones. Apple Books uh, is another one. But there's also a whole load of library markets, for example, are expanding. Uh, my audio books are in library as well as ebooks and some print books. Uh, but libraries are expanding their digital platforms because of the pandemic and whether that will continue post-pandemic as people have changed their behavior. Um, we've also got, I mean, you can, through Find Away Voices, which is how I do my audiobooks now, um, you can get to 42 different retailers, including Storytel, which is in so many countries around the world. Any country that is not dominated by Amazon, Storytel is basically basically hoovering up that market. Um, you've got Scribd, you've got lots of these services. And then what is so exciting coming, like I've only been doing it a couple of weeks, is direct audio sales through BookFunnel. So BookFunnel has an app um, and I can now sell audio direct to an audio app. Um, and I'm just I'm selling lots of audio directly. Now, what this means is I'm getting 90% royalty on ebooks and audiobooks. And uh, if you know about royalties, 90% is faintly ridiculous. I mean, it's it's just the highest you can possibly get uh, because there are always going to be fees um, and platform uh, things. But yeah, so I think that, I mean, for me, audio, audio is a hugely important uh, way of making money. It's also an incredibly important way to reach people. So I'm an audiobook listener. Um, if you're if you're not marketing on podcasts, for example, I'm probably not going to hear about your book because podcast listening to podcasts is the way I consume, and then listening to nonfiction audiobooks is a primary primary way I read. And m more and more people doing this, especially in the younger category. This is very interesting. It used to be that audio books on tape, you know, were for older people, but it's people under 40 uh, yeah. is the is a huge part of the audio market. Um, you know, my brother said to me, I'm not, I'm not going to read your book until it's available in audio. I don't do anything but audio now. Um, so this is the thing. Having audiobooks is fantastic. And it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to do, but for nonfiction, like I narrate my own, um, I have an audio booth here in, in my corner, uh, which is just some blankets, you know, over a frame. Uh, so I record my own nonfiction. I work with professional narrators for my novels. Um, and I work with Findaway Voices who help me find those narrators and then help me do the production and all that. So you don't need to be technical, really. Um, and I've got a book, Audio for Authors, if people are interested, all about audiobooks and podcasting and voice tech, because that's the other thing. Um, smartphones with voice search, um, Alexa, Google Home, Apple, HomePod, all these different things. And when people are in their cars, smart assistants with cars, voice search is a huge thing. And if people are doing voice search, they want something in audio to be returned. So yeah. what I would say is if you are ignoring audio, you really need to stop ignoring it. <laughs> It's only going to get bigger. And it actually, it changes your writing. Uh, I've actually interviewed a, a Scottish author, Jules Horn, who's written a book about writing for audio. And uh, it, it changes the way you write because it needs to be more lyrical. It needs to be smoother. It needs to, you need to structure things differently. So I found writing for audio and selling audio to be quite transformative, really. Look, thanks so much, uh, Joe. I know it's all uh, incredibly interesting, important stuff, and it's uh, uh, a great guide, I think, for, for authors as to how they should go about producing a business plan and, importantly, why. And I have uh, two copies of your books here. One is the, um, the Guide to Business Planning Itself, and the other is a really useful workbook, uh, which uh, contains um, lots of really supportive information and, uh, and even further insights. And uh, where's the best place where people can get hold of these books? Yes. So if you come to thecreativepen.com forward slash books, there are links to all my books there. And of course, they're on all the usual stores or you can order them in your bookshop if you'd like to. They should be on bookshop.org um, as well. And you can order them from your local bookseller. They're in all the catalogs. Um, but or you can buy direct from me. So essentially, they should be everywhere. Um, but yeah, thecreativepen.com. And of course, if you like podcasting or YouTube, I do have a YouTube channel, The Creative Pen. Well, thanks so much, Joan. I'm very grateful for your time.
Oh, thanks for having me, Pete. This has been fun.